Thank you, Jeff, for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and good afternoon to this uh, third uh, IVIS webinar in collaboration with ASSIST. So my name is Joost Dam, an intervention and cardiologist here in the uh, Thorax Center in the Erasmus University Medical Center of Rotterdam. Uh, hosting this webinar uh, today, as usual, with my friend and colleague Jürgen Lichthardt. Mm -hmm. And the focus of today will be on post-PCI optimization. So what we'll do is give you a, a brief introduction. So if you can uh, pop up the slides. Um, so the idea of this course is to do a step-by-step -step IVIS guided PCI tutorial with the ASSIST HDI system to, along with the Kodama catheter. We are focusing on basic principles of, uh, of, of image interpretation. Uh, we focus on procedural planning and we focus on post-PCI optimization. And the latter is exactly the topic that uh, we intend to, uh, to cover today. So the intention of these webinars is to be really practically oriented. So um, you will not see a lot of signs. It will be mostly uh, cases and, uh, and reviews of, of patients that we've uh, encountered in our routine practice. Um, so as mentioned, the, uh, the uh, webinar will be based on, on mainly on images that uh, have been uh, made with the assist HDI system, so 60 megahertz high definition IVIS system, which really allows you to uh, uh, see the uh, vascular wall and, and all the structures in and around the vascular wall with, uh, with a very high resolution. Uh, and as mentioned, the focus of today is on post-PCI optimization. And in order to introduce that, I just want to show you two slides. Uh, illustrating that using the IVIS catheter per se doesn't guarantee better outcomes. And this is just an example of the, uh, of the findings of the, uh, of the Chinese ultimate trial that was uh, published uh, several years ago, demonstrating that uh, IVIS guided PCI resulted in significantly lower major adverse cardiovascular event rates at one year as compared to angiography guided PCI with a MACE rate reduction of around 47%. However, if you divide this group of patients that underwent IVIS guided PCI, so the group with the 2.9% event rate, into patients that uh, underwent optimal PCI, as defined by IVIS defined optimization criteria, being minimal standard area above 5, plug burden at the edges below 50%, uh, and a uh, lack of uh, residual submedial stent edge dissections. If that was the case, patients had event rates of only 1.6% versus 4.4%, which were very close to the angiography-guided arm in patients uh, with suboptimal PCI. So that said, uh, I think this illustrates a little bit the, uh, the concept of, uh, of optimal PCI. And it was actually very funny to see that in the uh, New England just uh, a few months ago when the flavor trial was presented, IVIS versus FFR guided PCI, also in an Asian population, in this case Korean, uh, identical event rates. But what was very interesting that they did the same sub-analysis in this, in, this, uh, in this study in which they looked at patients in the IVIS guided PCI arm that uh, finally ended up with optimal PCI versus suboptimal PCI. And again, also in this trial, a 1.5 absolute difference in event rates in those undergoing optimal versus uh, suboptimal IVIS guided PCI. So as mentioned, focus of today on post-PCI imaging. Uh, and here just to briefly highlight the three key aspects of, of uh, optimal PCI. So we look at expansion, expansion defined as a minimal stent area of five or higher, or at least 90% of the distal reference area. We look at stent edge dissections, um, relevant. So what do we call relevant? Length larger than three millimeters and dissections involving the media, which can easily be interpreted by both by IVIS as well as OCT. And, and this is perhaps the most important thing because what we've learned is that in case there is a uh, suboptimal IVIS guided PCI, that is mostly due not to stand edge dissections, not to under expansion, but mostly due to geographic miss, meaning a plug burden at the edges of the stand above 50%. And that is something that uh, you will also see in the cases that we, we will present to you today, a uh, very frequent finding. This is just an example, uh, distally uh, stand edge on the right, a minimal stand area of 11, so you would say, well, that is excellent. Um, if you look at the panel on the left, you see uh, a very healthy uh, reference segment, but just at the frame, just distal to the stand edge, you see a plug burden of, of 70%. So plug burden is defined on a per frame basis. You calculate the area of the vessel, you calculate the area of the lumen, 
and that uh, is a simple uh, simple equation between lumen area divided by vessel area and that uh, um, and that the opposite of, of 100% in this case uh, 4.8 divided by 16 is 30 uh, 100 minus 30 is 70 percent here another example of a patient that underwent angiographically guided PCI distally uh, again still plug burden uh, above 50 percent whereas just a few millimeters distal the, uh, the vessel would have been uh, healthy uh, here another example of a case with a uh, distal uh, stand edge ending in the middle of a plug here a minimal stand area only 2.6 so an underexpanded stand but exactly uh, due to uh, landing in a area of what we call geographic mist so any area with a lot of plug whereas only a few millimeters distal the uh, reference vessel segment would have been uh, completely healthy uh, edge -edge sections Jürgen uh, I leave you the word to uh, report a little bit on the on the details of, uh, of what we call edge dissections yeah. we present you a couple of cases as example yeah that's uh <coughs> Uh, just one moment if you have the next slide and a couple of uh, yeah we go uh, back to yeah. the slides and yeah. then uh, maybe you yeah. can briefly yeah. comment on that uh, so section. what you see here is um, at uh, the left uh, uh, part uh, we put it in motion we have a distal edge section so you see first the vessel uh, outside the stand and then you can appreciate around uh, seven o'clock that uh, the uh, the plug is loose from the wall and just uh, uh, just at the edge of the stand. Now the idea is that um, you uh, we are always more concerned for uh, distal edge sections than for proximal. I will uh, later explain you why. And di because distal edge sections tend to uh, to fill uh, that you have a submedial or subinternal uh, filling and so that can uh, uh, create a new stenosis or even a closure there and especially the ones that you have uh, at least more than 90 degrees but then m for more than three millimeters in length those are the ones that you want to uh, to treat and you see here the the moving part on the on the left side and you see the still frames of the same one you can appreciate in the middle so you can see the uh, the dissection in the mid portion around seven o'clock and the colored uh, bar in uh, the right part that shows you the cavity uh, uh, which will be filled with um, with blood then uh, there are a couple of other examples that we found uh, re uh, uh, recently. We call this also submedial edge section. That means that the media is uh, uh, is disrupted. Uh, the top one uh, you can uh, see also at seven o'clock. Um, you see that the media is coming in, yeah. and um, and you see that also more distal. This also a small hematoma that is indicated by the arrow on the top, uh, the middle top one, uh, uh, the arrow is indicating the hematoma sort of cavity behind the, uh, the media filled with uh, blood. Uh, the bottom one, uh, that's, uh, that's a smaller vessel and you can appreciate the stem that's coming in, but also there. And you see that that vessel there is normal. So it's not always in plaque that you find the edge sections. Here you see it's a normal vessel so that the, uh, the intima and the media were loose from the, from the adventitia due to the edge section and also created a hematoma in there. And uh, on the bottom in the middle you see the arrow indicating uh, the part, uh, the, the loose uh, uh, flap and on the right is the, uh, edge, uh, the stand edge. Uh, one more, then we also have proximal edge sections. Uh, also, this one is a submedial edge section. Uh, however, if um, a proximal edge section, the flap tends to be uh, uh, pushed against the wall uh, by the the, uh, the blood flow, and uh, so uh, there you have less risk for uh, later problems. In there, it will uh, cure. And uh, yeah, what we always say, uh, you can leave it there until. But if you have a loose flap that is waving to you like the Princess of Wales on a wedding day, then uh, you want to stand this because then you have an, uh, later you have a risk of uh, thrombosis in there. Okay, yeah. so that's that. Um, 
before we go into the cases, uh, one uh, short note. So the idea of these webinars yeah. is to really keep it uh, interactive. So please use the uh, QA or the chat functionality within your Zoom window to, uh, to, uh, to ask questions. We will try to address all of them uh, as we go through the cases. So please don't hesitate to, uh, to drop the questions. We will have a close look at the chat box and then uh, try to address all your, uh, all your, all your pertinent questions. Are there already questions? Or? No, I haven't seen no. any yet, but uh, I expect at least some during the, okay. uh, the course of the, of the webinar. So we will we'll start with the case. So this is a case of a 67-year-old female patient with a history of smoking, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and a uh, impaired uh, renal function with a GFR of 36, heart failure with an ejection fraction of 35, and a history of leukemia with a stem cell transplantation, who now presents with a uh, non-STEMI. Uh, so this was actually a very interesting case I did only a few weeks ago in which the patient had already heart failure for years, was treated with optimal medication, but now was admitted with uh, refractory angina and uh, mild troponin rise. Uh, with this EKG showing, showing you uh, a diffuse, actually, uh, signs of diffuse ischemia. And that appeared to be the case because when we did the diagnostic angio of the patient, you see here on the right, on the left side of the screen, uh, the right coronary, which was uh, small and, uh, and 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 perhaps somewhat diseased osteally. But then the key problem was in the osteum of the left main, which was uh, in this angiogram, which was after nitrates, uh, subtotal with immediate dampening and uh, and loss of pressure. So that's why you see the uh, the, the wire already here in a small uh, intermediate branch. And um, we continued here because the patient immediately was unstable because also, I mean, she was known with a very poor LV. We proceeded with a, a trio non-compliant balloon in the left main and then um, proceeded with an IFIS. So we also wired the circumflex, by the way, to so two wires. The patient was uh, at that time completely stable and we uh, continued with an IVIS uh, LED towards osteum uh, left main. You can see the IVIS probe where it started, so uh, then we go to the tablet, and uh, the tablet is uh, something nice that we have here, so it's uh, exactly looking like uh, uh, your screen of uh, the assist console. I even uh, can um, handle this uh, with, uh, with my fingers because it's touch screen, however, for this uh, I use uh, the mouse. So we started in the uh, in the distal LED, and we see, we appreciate the distal LED that is uh, normal. I'm going to enlarge a bit the, uh, the vessel. So if we move proximal, we see that we have a long series of normal, a normal appearance of the vessel, and that's promising already for, to find a nice landing zone. So then we find here the intermediate branch and the, uh, and the uh, circumflex, and then we find here the minimal luminal area with, the U with a lot of plaque. We call this mixed plaque. Uh, there's not much calcium, but we see some fibrous and fibro fatty material in there. So I think that this, uh, well, normally I say uh, for placing a stent, the minimal luminal area is the least interesting um, uh, part to measure. So uh, for now, because we see now that we uh, end up here in the aorta and we have a osteal lesion or a le uh, 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 significant and important lesion in the left main, so we have to stand the left main. So we have to stand it until uh, the osteum. Now it's case to find a landing zone. And this is after uh, this is already after this 3.0 uh, NC balloon, and you see there is some irregularity, but still the lumen is uh, uh, quite small. I think, Joost, that uh, you want to cover, you want to go over the uh, circumflex in this case. Yeah, so this was actually yeah. the interesting part, Jurgens, because yeah. I knew that the circumflex was dominant, and the circumflex was, was bigger in caliber as compared to the LED simply because of the fact that the LED yeah. had two large branches. So yeah. you have one intermediate and then one diagonal going off. So the landing zone of the stand, suppose we would like to stand from osteo left main to any LED, that would be a huge discrepancy in caliber. Yeah. And that is exactly, th that was my, my uh, first question when we did this pullback. Yeah. So maybe you can show us what the caliber of the LED is at the position where you would potentially land yeah, your stand. I would, I would potentially go in here. 
And then if we measure the caliber, so I'm going to do an area, by the way, guys, if you measure areas, you get for free, uh, you get for free the dimensions. So then you only have to do uh, one measurement for the biggest and the smallest dimension. So we see here uh, an area 5.3, but interesting is the caliber we have 2.35 millimeters, the smallest diameter in here, by 2.8. So if you round it up a little bit, then we come up by three around. Yeah, so that, yeah. that that is indeed quite generous if you would go to three because um, and and the sec but but again I mean two two point four times two point eight that is what we found yeah. in this healthy uh, proximal LED. Yeah. And then the second question I had: is How does the osteum of the LED look? And actually, the osteum of the LED looked actually healthy. Yeah. Do you agree, Jurgen? Uh, yeah, I agree. And uh, there is one thing that there is a little bit distance between the intermediate branch yeah. that comes in here. Yeah. So you have actually a sort of second osteum. Yeah. in here and uh, that second osteum is not that healthy because mm -hmm. we see here that there is uh, a calcification of at least 90 degrees yep and then was the question is well do you want to land in this mm -hmm. osteum or do you want to go over the intermediate branch and land in this osteum that was the question yeah. uh, with the alternative of standing into the circumflex and if you go back to the case uh, Maybe show the slide. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we went, uh, we did the pullback, uh, and then yeah. we lost the slides. And here we, I decided to go into the circumflex. So the circumflex was completely healthy. If I go back quickly to the angio, you can see that the circumflex was at least angiographically completely healthy uh, and had a caliber of around uh, four millimeters. So we went with standing here um, with a 4018 um, stand from osteum left main into the circumflex and then repeated the pullback. Okay, that's... And remember the focus of today is on post-PCI optimization yeah. and we have specific cases with specific potential problems that you will encounter. Uh, obviously all open for debate, yeah. but this is uh, just to, uh, yeah, to, yeah. To, to share with you our thoughts on uh, yeah, how IVIS could help you to, uh, to guide your procedure. Yeah. And remember guys, so you see the second wire in the LED and uh, we first did the IVIS in the L6, so keep that in mind because that's what I'm going to point you out one thing uh, on that. So if we can go back to the, uh, to the tablet, then here we have the, uh, the IVIS of the, <coughs> of the circumflex after the stent implantation. So uh, you see also the circumflex is quite uh, healthy and Indeed, here because we didn't do uh, this. Oh, sorry, I, I was, I was wrong. I had to go the next one. Well, now it's now we're cooking with gas. So again, we start in the circumflex, and indeed the circumflex is uh, uh, is bigger, healthy yeah. and bigger. Hey, we dominant circumflex. Joost mentioned it already, and then we see that is nice that the distal landing zone of the stent was in a healthy vessel and uh, well that's neat uh, even if we didn't do an IVIS before of the circumflex and we see we look at the apposition of the stent and then we see here proximal near and uh, we go we overlap the yeah that is what I want to point you out uh, it went a little bit further yeah here you see the bifurcation with the LED and you will recognize also the guide wire in the LED and we also see that there are stand struts over the bifurcation. In this case if we report on the IVAS afterwards we call then uh, that the bifurcation with the LED in this case is trapped, uh, it's jailed uh, because there are bars in there. Well now uh, remember this uh, guide wire was in there when we implanted the stand so if we go proximal then you'll find this guide wire trapped behind the stand struts, this is the left main. Sorry, go to this is the left main. The wire guide wire is trapped behind the stand struts. That's why you see only one guide wire now. Uh, we have a little bit this uh, if it's so egg shaped, I call it also uh, under expanded uh, because of uh, calcium, eh? but um, that doesn't say anything about the minimal luminal area. And we see that this stent is now overlapping or protruding into the aorta. So in this case, we do not find any edge sections, not on the proximal part because we are protruding there. Uh, we check for an edge section distal. Oh. 
Maybe we yeah. can also show the uh, I guess the uh, the longitudinal view that may that helps a little bit the the audience to yeah. appreciate where in the vessel we are. Yeah, this excellent. one. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, see here we are out uh, at the distal edge. Distal edge is normal, and in this case there is no edge section. Now the next step is to find, and that uh, you do with your what we call the carpenter's eye, and the minimal luminal area in here, and you see that there's some calcium pushing against the uh, the ivus or actually or against the stent actually the stent tries to push the calcium away but let's make here the minimal luminal area of this stent in the circumflex and let's see we're talking now about 7.8 square millimeters that if we go for the optimal stent uh, 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 criteria, this is uh, far beyond uh, five, so I think we can assume that uh, on this part uh, this uh, stand placement is graduated. Yeah. Yep. So, all right. Yeah. Yeah, so we proceeded here um, with a uh, little bit of post dilatation of the, uh, of the proximal part, but then we had this osteal LED. And uh, we knew this was a patient with a history of malignancy, uh, a uh, poor uh, LV, um, and uh, a higher risk of, of thromboembolic as well as bleeding complications. So um, we thought what to do with the osteum of the LED. You see on the angio that maybe the osteum was a little bit hazy, so I, I, I didn't like it. Hmm. So we uh, repeated, we rewired the, uh, the LED and then uh, did an IVIS from the yeah. LED. Now there we see what uh, actually what happened. So we start again in the normal vessel that we already know, uh, distal and mid LED. So we go Proximal, there is, uh, well, this was our first um, uh, intended landing zone. There is our uh, intermediate branch. And here is the other osteum. And you see now that if you compare that, if you keep in mind the, the first one, that we see here the calcium, but we also see that the vessel is now compressed from the other side by the stent from, from the, the circumflex. circumflex. Yeah. Exactly. So, if we measure now here the minimal luminal area, and you see I use now the mouse, but in the cat lab you can use just your very easily your fingers with this. So we have now 4.09 square millimeters, but it's sort of egg-shaped, it's very compressed in there, and for a large LED, I would say, say that this is uh, uh, borderline, but I think that uh, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if someone wants to treat this. Yeah, so this was obviously the, uh, the clinical dilemma we had. There was a osteo lesion in the LED. Um, the IVIS demonstrated us on the one hand that the minimal luminal area was four, mm -hmm. which we know the likelihood that you will find a positive FFR with the MLA above yeah. four is close to yeah. zero. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, there was already a very poor ejection fraction with an yeah. old anterior myocardial infarction in this patient. And third, and this is perhaps also very important, is that the IVIS showed you this was actually a plug. This was not a high lipidemic thin no. cap fibroateroma. It's actually an eccentric plug with superficial calcium, mm -hmm. so which likely has a lower likelihood of causing uh, a plug rupture uh, in, the, in the near to longer term as compared to when this would have been a uh, thin gap fibroateroma or at least a, a highly yep. lipidemic plug with a, uh, with a thin cap. Um, but uh, given the borderline uh, MLA, we decided to, uh, to continue here with a, uh, just by opening the struts towards the LED a little bit, did a kissing balloon with a 3.5 balloon semi-compliant into the CERG, a 3.0 uh, uh, balloon into the um, LED, and then ended uh, with, a, with a kissing also with the, with the Magic Touch drop-coated balloon just to increase the likelihood perhaps a little bit that this lesion would cause problems in the near future and then ended up with a final IVIS and maybe that is uh, the last pullback of this case Correct. that yeah. uh, that we can show you. So then we start again in the proximal uh, LED close to the intermediate branch. Uh, we appreciate some uh, fiber fatty plaque uh, in here. Uh, there is, uh, so and if we move proximal then we see the intermediate branch and then here we have the uh, uh, this, the spot where we had this 
for uh, four uh, millimeter, square millimeter uh, lumen. And we can appreciate here the stent coming from the circumflex, but let's uh, measure this to see what the drug diluting balloon did. And you see that uh, the calcium didn't move much, but uh, the part that uh, had, oh yeah, sorry, I have, I make one, I was not that very, uh, we have to be playing honest, of course, because <laughs> this was too big. So we're going from here. So we see a couple of stent struts there from the circumflex. So now we're measuring and you see that now we have uh, more than one square millimeter regained. And you see that the calcium is still in shape, but this part gave way, was the least resistance, and there was room for, indeed, that uh, it was possible to improve this. Yep. And then still we have, I think we still have, no, and also with a kissing balloon, that's also important, look at this. Now we have, instead of these 10 struts in front, we have now an open connection carina. with the yep. carina, an open carina. Yep. Yep, so um, yeah, in this case, the IVIS, I think, helped us to minimize the, uh, the procedure by, by refraining from, from doing a left main bifurcation stenting approach, which, um, at least from my perspective, would not necessarily yield better outcomes. Um, there is one question, Jurgen. There is yeah. a question from, uh, from somebody online uh, saying that we are looking minimal stent area above 5.5 for a 4 millimeter stent. Will it be the same for vessel stand size of 2.75? Ah, there, um, that's a very good question. And I think that uh, actually I wanted to address uh, uh, a bit this. Uh, because um, um, just like in normal life, um, one size fits all doesn't uh, exist. So uh, um, with a small vessel in, um, in uh, if you have a small vessel there, then the five square millimeters you will not reach, but then you're going to check for your distal reference. And then you want to have your minimal luminal area in that stent uh, at least 90% of your distal reference in there. And that helps you with the optimization because of course in small vessels, you never reach the five square millimeters. On the other hand, and that is also something to keep in mind, uh, this five square millimeters, some five, uh, 5.4 uh, square millimeters, uh, that also does not uh, literally count always for everyone. You can have someone with very big vessels and then actually the five square millimeters may not be enough. And that is also that you can check if you're not sure also about the distal uh, reference. And uh, remember that the studies are done in, in, uh, in Asian uh, countries, so uh, that in general they have smaller vessels. Uh, but uh, also look at the vessels, look at the person that you're treating, how big are the vessels. And sometimes uh, even if you're above already the uh, five square millimeters, maybe you need to uh, post dilate anyway to get it a bit more in shape with the actual size of the vessel. It works two, ta two, two ways, small vessel, then you never reach it, accept it, big vessel, then you can have a question mark, well, is the five square millimeter or the five, five and a half square millimeter, is that enough? So, it, uh, so optimal stent um, uh, implantation is also a dynamic stuff. Hey, you, look your, you look at the situation yeah. and then you act <coughs> accordingly, isn't it, Joost? I, yeah. I totally agree and, and I would, would, would give you two recommendations. One is um, these figures, 5 or 5.5 in the 90% are derivatives from studies based on yeah. Asian patients telling you that if you reach at least 5 or 5.5 or a uh, expansion more than 90% of the different reference every area, the likelihood that this patient will come back is yeah. extremely low. So yeah. according yeah. to uh, flavor, for instance, 1.4% in a two-year time frame. Well, so that is, that is a common number one. Common number two is you're completely right. The nominal stand area of a 3.5 millimeter stand would be 9.6 millimeters whereas a 4.0 stand has a if the stand would be yeah. um, expanded in okay. in vitro Get would 16. have an area of 13. Yeah. so if you have a, a minimal stand area of six in a 4.0 stand you could say well six is well above five yeah 
but you could also say it's only 50% of the intended uh, uh, expansion area. So always keep thinking. And uh, the second, the third maybe important comment is always keep in mind the uh, plug burden as it at the distal yeah. reference. If the yeah. distal reference is diseased, yeah. and if you impl just implanted a 4-0 four, a four stand, has a five millimeter minimal stand area, and the distal lumen area or minimal lumen area in the edge is around four, you would say, well, this is, is perfect, it's above five, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the stand is, has an expansion yeah. of 110%. But imagine that this MLA of four in a disease healthy plug should not count. Yeah. The reference segment area that you use as a reference for your expansion limit should be healthy. Yeah. If it's not healthy, and we'll show you a couple of examples for this, yeah. um, the expansion figure actually is very relative. Yeah. So I hope that uh, that clarifies yeah. things, yeah. and then uh, yeah. we'll proceed to uh, to case number two. Uh, yes, for a moment, then I will have to open this. So one. case number two is a um, case of a male patient, 77 years of age, uh, unremarkable history that presented with the anterior STEMI and uh, was included in one of our IFAS guided PCI trials. Um, so we thought it would be, would be nice to show that to you. So this is a right dominant system, diffusely diseased right, no focal relevant disease, but a uh, occluded LAD. We recanalized the, uh, the LAD and then per protocol started with an IFAS pullback. So no ballooning, no thrombectomy, directly IFAS. And um, um, yeah, Jürgen will take you through the uh, through the pullback yeah. uh, in a second. So obviously we'll see thrombus, but uh, we'll demonstrate to you that the IVs will help you to uh, to, to to let's say find optimal uh, landing zones. Uh, also in these cases. Yeah, yeah indeed there we are. Uh, just remove one bookmark and then. There we go. So we start uh, again in here in the distal LED. The distal LED here is not that healthy. We uh, see some mixed plaque and mixed plaque that means that you contain, you can have uh, some fiber fatty plaque and calcium in here. Uh, nevertheless, the lumen is uh, for distal LED fine. More proximal, you can see that the vessel is uh, normal. Uh, so this is also to keep in mind as uh, maybe a distal reference. If we continue, we see that we get the plaque around here and uh, we have a li minimal luminal area uh, here so this is that we want to address here we have a side branch a diagonal branch and and what we see here because this is pre-dilatation and uh, we see here uh, already a dissection after the ballooning there so was no ballooning oh, was no ballooning. oh sorry no. then i was uh, now that's um, no, there was no, sorry, there was no ballooning. We see already here indeed, uh, yeah, a, uh, then in this case, then uh, if there was no ballooning, then you can see here some rest of uh, probably an old uh, plaque rupture. You can see a fragment here that could have been connected in here, but also on the bottom. Often you see this uh, uh, parts uh, also in calcified, uh, uh, calcified lesion here. Here you see it clearly, uh, this, the, there is a cap in there and so that we can have an old uh, plaque rupture in here and with calcium sometimes you can doubt uh, be, uh, uh, because of that uh, but it's likely that uh, in the past uh, you can find uh, these older pa plaque ruptures what were done in the past so here we are in the here we get in the circumflex uh, sorry in, in the diagonal yeah in diagonal here we have a huge uh, plaque, uh, de uh, definitely a huge plaque burden with a smaller uh, lumen. Uh, this, this region here, uh, if I put this in motion, here I suspect that we have not only plaque but that we also have uh, part of uh, uh, subacute uh, thrombus in there. You can see uh, the, the mass is uh, moving in there. Here we have the plaque that we have some mixed plaque, fiber fatty fibers, and also some deep calcium. And actually, here this is typical. You see the pla you see here a transition, a uh, sort of border line with uh, material on this and a border line on this. So we have here an eccentric fiber fatty plaque, and upon this there is some subacute thrombus that is resting against 
the wall. Thrombus is always resting against the wall, apart from the, the loose parts that you can su swim, uh, see swimming in your lumen, but they're always connected with thrombus that is attached uh, to the wall. So here we get a part that um, more eccentric fibrous material, and at the end we have here the circumflex, and then because of the guiding is uh, quite selective, then uh, that's also the end of the pullback. Now if we look here at the ostium of the LED, then I think that uh, maybe I will measure that, see what we have for plug burden here, then yeah. we know that it's a nice uh, landing zone. Well, to do so, you first draw, first you select that you want to do an area, then you draw the inside. Well, I always start with the inside with the lumen. You can correct a bit. Then you choose again the area and then you go for your area of the, I always say the media. A lot of people tell, talk about EEM, but actually EEM itself you cannot see on IVERS. Always take the media, it's much easier to draw and uh, no discussions of that, then you're close. Now, then you see 12 square millimeters, 12 now square millimeters, lumen 7.4, so that's enough. But then we get a plaque burden of 40 and a half percent, less than 50. And guys, I will tell you a secret. A plaque burden less than 50, um, and that is some uh, publications uh, in the 90s, one of uh, in, uh, before the IVES that was uh, 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 that by a pathologist uh, and uh, Herr Miller uh, repeated on IVES. A plaque burden of less than 50, you can consider the lumen uh, size, the lumen as the uh, original total vessel size. Above 50, then your lumen starts um, uh, to, comp uh, to compress. So it's not always, and I'm always uh, very uh, uh, advise against that, never uh, make a stand size based on media to media. Uh, because you, uh, you have to take into account the, the, uh, the positive remodeling. But if you have, in this case, then a plaque burn less than 50, then you can consider your lumen size as the size of the original vessel, and that helps you with sizing your stent. So I think we have here a good uh, landing zone, uh, Joost. Yeah, that was indeed yeah. the intention, I think, of yeah. the operator here, to land yeah. the stent here at the, uh, the proximal part and thereby avoid uh, standing the uh, ostium of the circumflex yeah. and the left main. And uh, that's also exactly how this case proceeded. So if we go back to the slides, I can show you the, uh, the angels. Mm -hmm. So after the IVIS uh, standing with a 27538 and a 3.5 non-compliant balloon. So we didn't show you the length sizing, but uh, I think that in this case is probably the, the, the easier yeah. thing to do. Uh, we sized a little bit based on the, uh, on the, on the distal reference and then uh, upgraded to a 3.5 uh, proximal in the LED. Um, Here ballooning, and then we uh, continued with an IVIS. So yeah. that's again the beauty of the IVIS. There's no need to shoot all kinds of angels in the middle of the in the, in the middle of the procedure. Save some contrast, and uh, with the assist, you can do a pullback at 2.5 or even 10 millimeters per second, which uh, hardly costs any time. You, you can use yeah. your regular guide wire, and the the catheter easily uh, uh, allows yeah. you to get a very uh, clear appreciation of the of the stenting result. Uh, pullback starts again, and this is crucial. Always start the pullback in a healthy reference segment yeah. because only then you will be able to uh, to find reference areas to land your stand and do proper length measurements or do proper assessment of the distal stand edge. Yeah. So don't start the pullback in the middle of the stand <laughs> no. because yeah, that will yeah. preclude uh, any assessment of the distal edge. Now then, I think that here we do some uh, work before. You see here that we have a normal uh, normal vessel. Let's make a measurement of this for the reference already. Then, so we're going to measure the lumen area. So expansion reference is based on a lumen area, yeah. not on a vessel area. Yeah. So you draw the lumen, that the is lumen important. Yeah, exactly. so in this case, so distal reference lumen area 5.6. Yeah, keep yeah. that in mind. We can go back because automatically there is a bookmark made. So we can also, now then we see the stand there, so far so good, it lands in some plaque, no, no worries. But then here already, distal already, 
then I see that the stand here is a post, but there is a lot of material behind that maybe uh, that maybe can be stretched. I see here a minimal luminal stand area. So let's make an, um, a calculation in here. Remember, this was a 275 stand. 275, uh, yeah, indeed. So I make this calculation, and then we have a lumina 3.5, 2 by 2.1. Remember that we have 5.6 and that we want to have at least 90% of this 5.6. Yeah. Well, I don't need a calculator to see that this is below this 90%. Absolutely, <laughs> suboptimal. Yes, suboptimal. So that we keep in mind already. Yep. Now see what we have uh, uh, more proximal. So we have overlap of a uh, diagonal branch. What you see here that the stands are uh, just for your attention that uh, you recognize it. Uh, we have a jailed diagonal branch. Uh, you can choose to open that or, or, or not, but this is how it looks. And you see also here that there is a lot of room behind the stand and a lot of room not, uh, not uh, calcified or, or only fibers, but also softer tissue. So a softer tissue gives way. So there is room for improvement in here. And you see here that after the plug then if there's less plug that this stand here is well opposed and deployed yeah you see here indeed the, the yeah. effect of the post dilatation yeah and the proximal part so it actually does work yeah that does work and that only the distal part didn't get this share yet so again here a lot of plug behind the stand but we saw already the minimal luminal area and then we are outside the stand and now it's interesting because you remember the, the, the plug burden before 40% and that what would be our uh, ideal landing zone. Now let's measure here where we have the plug burden within five millimeters. We always do try to keep within five millimeters uh, distance of uh, the stand. Let's see what we're dealing here with. So we're going for the lumen. And we're going for the media and then we have plug burden here of a bit more than 50 yeah yeah and um, so then you can say well we can accept that it's more than 50 it's okay but you can uh, uh, but you sense our uh, thoughts already a bit that actually uh, uh, perfectionist as we are that actually we would have wished that we could can, have can landed you, in here. Can you go to frame 1164? 1164, yes, sure. In the mean, and then measure the uh, plug burden again. 1164. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, just want to my glasses. Yeah, I got it here. That's around here. But this is in the stand. Yeah, the, so a few stands more, a few, uh, few, few frames more proximal than? More proximal than, as uh, also still in the stand. You want to go outside the yeah, stand? Out, out, out. Yeah. And here we are outside. Yeah, shall I ma shall I make this one? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. let's do. Yeah. But okay, so this is this is again so a, a beautiful example of, of how this looks suboptimal, uh, both from an expansion perspective as well as a uh, uh, edge perspective and here in this case it's completely different than the plug that we've encountered in the proximal LED of the previous case so this is a fibro fatty plug there's no calcium um, yeah it's, yeah, it's the it's question whether it, uh, the borderline, eh? whether this would be <laughs> yeah. uh, wh whether this is something that you would like to leave alone with a uh, area of almost seven or uh, continue with stunting in this case uh, if we go back to the slides I believe the operator here decided to uh, put an additional stand, uh, 3.513, do some additional post dilatation, and in this case actually cover the uh, the full left, left main with uh, with metal, and uh, then repeated the uh, the final pullback. Oh, sorry. Whereas uh, Jürgen is trying to pull up the pullback, uh, I have two comments. Uh, one is uh, the fact that uh, we try to select these cases as we discuss many of our cases on a, in a weekly or bi-weekly basis here in Erasmus, not to uh, finger point or whatsoever, but just to illustrate that, that also here we miss things. And um, not all our cases end with optimal PCI. Yeah. 
which actually is very much reflective of, of, of uh, uh, Asian PCI studies in which the percentage of cases in which optimal PCI is re reached is around 50%. So still one in two patients has issues like this uh, in which uh, optimal stentoring criteria would not be uh, achieved. The goal of all these webinars is to make you aware of, of what are the, the, the items to look for. And obviously uh, many of the treatments here you'll see are, are open for debate. Uh, and not necessarily chosen because they, they are the perfect example of, of a, a perfect way of doing PCI. Can I tell you something? Second, I've, you're I'll you, yeah, one very yeah. short, if, yeah, if sure. I may. Uh, there was one question on nitroglycerin, which is a very important one. So this uh, uh, attendee here asks, so I was performed in an occluded artery, so, nine, no, so no, no nitroglycerin. Is the distal reference diameter re uh, reliable in these situations? A very good question. Uh, we attempted to, in this with at least within the study protocol, to always give nitrates in patients with uh, uh, after occlusion, uh, after passage of the of the uh, IVIS catheter, as we routinely do in our practice. Uh, as this is a very valid comment, there's typically some spasm in the occluded vessel that uh, will likely resolve after ballooning or stenting or whatsoever. So very important comment, uh, always give nitrates before yeah. you do your uh, pullback. But in this case, you saw that also after the stenting, the distal uh, area was uh, definitely yeah. uh, um, not too large to accommodate the yeah. 2.75 stent, uh, despite the fact that this was a Proxima LED. Yeah. But okay, let's go back to the uh, back to the case yeah. to see if well, this uh, additional maneuver optimized <laughs> the uh, the outcome of the, at least the procedural outcome of this patient. I have to tell you something, Joost. I got the wrong IVIS. You got the wrong the pullback. Wrong, patient, wrong pullback. Oui. The, yeah, oui. That was two. There were two different uh, numbers. One was uh, two four one, and f I need to have four two one. I have the correct one. Anyway, so anyway. I, I don't <laughs> see any problem. I no. think the key thing was to 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 bring this uh, uh, up up to discussion. So distal. Yeah under expansion, exactly. no additional uh, balloon dilatation performed, whereas this would have been uh, likely better to improve stent expansion. And on the other hand, yeah. the proximal edge, and in this case, on the one additional stenting. But uh, yeah, that is obviously something open for debate. Yeah. It looks um, very much the same. Yeah. 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 But we have another case in which yeah. we will uh, uh, show you a similar problem. So this is uh, case number three in which um, we present to you a 74-year-old male patient with a history of smoking, yep. hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, and renal insufficiency, peripheral vascular disease, um, now presenting with stable angina. This patient had a uh, right that was okay, but a LAD, and that's the focus for today, with a, a tandem lesion in the proximal part, tight lesion yeah. just at the level of the, of the septal branch, and in the mid LAD at the level of a small uh, a diagonal branch, also a subtotal lesion. Uh, in this case, this patient uh, went routine, of perhaps not routine, but at least angio-guided PCI, uh, with pre-dilatation and then standing with a 3.526 millimeter stand proximally and a 2.515 millimeter stand distally. 2.5, 3.5, 2.5 distally. And then this patient uh, underwent a post-PCI FVR assessment, which appeared to be 0.77. You see that the stands are uh, uh, nicely expanded. Uh, edges look good on the uh, on the angiogram. Perhaps a little bit of disease proximal. Perhaps a little bit of disease very distal to the distal stent. But uh, in this case, the operator here decided to proceed with IVIS in order yeah. to get a better appreciation of the um, stenting result and the rationale for the FFR of 0.77. That after putting in two stents was uh, for sure uh, not really uh, rewarding. Yeah. Well, Rakesh, then we need now, yeah, perfect. Well, in this case, I uh, show you uh, the IVIS with our um, uh, Dicom viewer because this was just before it was possible to, uh, uh, to copy raw files into the tablet. So we don't have the tablet, but nevertheless, I think that you will uh, appreciate uh, the situation there. So we start in the distal um, uh, LED and it's not completely uh, healthy, as you can see. And here we have a healthy part, and the healthy part, indeed, there was the distal, comes soon, the distal stent. See, here's the distal stent. There is some plug in there, but you can see you don't need a calculator to see that this will be less than 50 um, 
percent plaque burden. This is the distal stent. Uh, could have been a little bit, uh, it, it looks a little bit under, uh, under expanded here. But it's actually the yeah. exact same thing. Are you? Yeah. So again, you see a stent landing in a plaque. Yeah. So the stent, and if you would measure the area uh, distally before the, uh, just at the level of do. the distal, uh, the distal edge. I will do. That is also with yeah, this, this is the healthy it's reference. Yeah, this the yeah the healthy reference is. Yeah. Uh, so but just draw two lines for the for the sake of demonstration. Yeah, then uh, this one, then I need this one. So you see, then we measure here uh, two point six, two point seven, two point seven five. Yeah, so two point seven five times uh, two point nine. Two points, uh, also 2.7. 2.7, okay. Yeah. And then if you would measure the diameters in the stand. Then here, for instance, this is an interesting one. Here. You see? You see, then if we measure here, then we get one point, uh, yeah, 1.9. And this one here, yeah, the colors are a little bit not my strong point. Uh, where are we? Cannot enlarge this, but also uh, small. Well, also small. Two point two. Two point two. two, yeah. two. Another color. So again, helps. I think a beautiful demonstration of how angio guided PCR resulted in this case yeah. in a stand that was either positioned too proximal or uh, was positioned yeah. uh, what well, was actually too short, yeah. because you missed the distal healthy reference vessel yeah. segment, and thereby ended up with a unnecessarily uh, small uh, minimal stand area. In this case, here at the at the yeah. distal edge. So. We delete the measurements and we proceed. This was a distal stent for the distal uh, lesional angiogram. Then we have another healthy vessel in the mid uh, area. And what you see here, by the way, I'll let it run now. Here we see a region with bridging, myocardial bridging yep. in there. Well, the thing with the uh, myocardial bridging, I just mentioned that uh, what we do normally with the assist system, we have that we have a two and a half millimeter in speed, yeah, two and a half millimeter mm -hmm. per second. The faster you go, the least uh, the least chance you have that you really appreciate the myocardial bridge. So I always um, and that I tell the guys also here, uh, if you have if you want to image uh, myocardial bridge, then switch to one millimeter per second or even half millimeter per second to appreciate. Then you see uh, this uh, movement, uh, this movement. And for people who think, well, we take an OCT for the myocardial bridge, that's way too fast because then you uh, only see the situation in the uh, systole or diastole and you cannot see the dynamics in there. Well, we have here a normal vessel and then here we reach uh, the edge of the proximal stent. The proximal stent is landed in almost normal vessel, which is, uh, which is good. Then if we continue, uh, we see that it's opposed, well opposed, deployment is okay, and we go more proximal, there we see, and then from proximal we see some thrombus protrusion there. Uh, see, you see the uh, thrombus going inside uh, the stent, uh, it's coming like toothpaste to the struts. Here we get a bit of under deployment due to some uh, fiber calcific uh, plaque, and then now it's interesting where did they land. So they landed here, but if we go more proximal, then we see here a minimal luminal area, but we see a huge plaque, also some thrombus in there. And then if we now measure for the plaque burden, then of course we want to have an area. So we measured it. Sometimes better to uh, put things a bit in movement to appreciate your uh, vessel wall, 5.33. So again, a proximal LED with a minimal lumen area of 5.3. 5.3. And now we're going outside, outside, look at that in the, in the media. And we see 16.69. Well, I think that also here we do not need a calculator yep. to see that it's far above the 50% plaque yep. burden. This is also more than uh, uh, almost 70% plaque exactly. burden. Exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, but again, a minimal lumen area of 5.3, yeah. uh, but a plug that looks completely different. So yeah. the plug here doesn't look nice and stable with, with some fibrous tissue or, or a, yeah. a cap of calcium. Yeah. This is rather thrombotic than, than, yeah. um, than very stable and calcified. Yeah. Um, but again, so uh, this is just uh, routine practice. So um, if you go back to the case, we'll show you what happened in this case. The uh, operator thought, you know, maybe we'll just need some uh, post dilatation at the proximal part, post dilated with a 3.5 NC balloon at 16 atmospheres. Repeated the FFR and actually discovered that the FFR went down from 0.77 to 0.75. Um, that's what you don't want. That's what you don't want, <laughs> but then thought, you know what, all the rest looks uh, looks nice and open. The MLA of the Osima of the LED is uh, 5.3, so we'll call it a day. Um, yeah, he was and then did a uh, final IFIS, just to confirm the effect of the post dilatation. Yeah, and, then, and then to have, uh, and then thinking that you go home with a good feeling. So we con uh, le let's concentrate on the proximal stent. Yep. Uh, distal stent, they didn't do anything. So we have here the, the normal vessel in the mid uh, uh, LED, the bridging we see here. And then we reach the stent, which is distal again, uh, was okay. Now we go more proximal and then see what happened. So we did post dilatation. We see even more tissue protrusion in there. Yeah, because there was no room for this tissue, or uh, I suspect this thrombus because it dig, uh, it buried um, several stent struts. Uh, here we, and here we have the distal edge, and this is the minimal luminal area. So let's measure again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then here we go. Lumen 4.39, it decreased a bit. 4.39, but still above uh, 4. You go outside. And 16. 18, uh, 16. Well, yeah, again, 16. it's even. Yeah. Uh, more plaque burden if you uh, yeah. calculate 73, this. 73 yeah. percent uh, to be exact. Yeah. Uh, there's one question with respect to this specific image, Jürgen. Yeah. Somebody is asking whether we include thrombus. So does yeah, is, is, is measuring plaque burden a, a a something that is a valid concept in case there is thrombus? Okay. I think it's that's a very original that's question. That's a very good question. Um, what I do in practice anyway. Uh, I include the thrombus. I include the thrombus because the thrombus is part. In this case, it's thrombus. You don't know what happens with the mm. thrombus can be be resolved, but in this case, it plays a part. It has its part in this plaque burden yeah. and also in this smaller thing, because uh, because we do not know uh, plaque behaves in a certain way. Mm. Thrombus also, and even if thrombus is not a plaque, it can behave. It can cause problems, and that that's why I include it always. Yeah. yeah, I tend to agree. Yeah. And yeah. of course, if you have a piece of floating thrombus in the lumen, yeah. then of course it's a different entity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that said, I think in terms of, of why we use plug burden, uh, I think it has little value in patients with uh, with ruptured plugs, thrombotic lesions, or patients with uh, with corporate lesions and STEMI. Uh, there you already see that the, the I mean, you measure plug burden because you mm -hmm. want to assess vulnerability. Yeah. You know that the plug burden about 50 or 70 percent increases the likelihood of plug rupture. But in case you already see an unstable plug, yeah, I mean yeah. the concept of measuring a surrogate of vulnerability is perhaps a little bit out of yeah. the question as well. Um, and then what can be done for thrombus plug protrusion like in this case? Yeah, actually nothing, right, Jürgen? No, I no. mean, uh, you can, uh, as Jürgen always says, you can push as much as you like, but the, the vessel will not grow any further and the tissue in between the stand and yeah, the, the, no the, the, the media yeah, cannot disappear. Yeah. We cannot take it out. Yeah. So if there's a, if the, if the stand is properly expansion, expanded and if there's a thrombus or plug protrusion, yeah, that's that's too bad. Uh, there's not much you can do. Uh, if yeah. it's a highly lipidemic plug and you keep on maneuvering, you increase the likelihood of, of no reflow. That is something we know for sure in lipid, high lipidemic plugs. Um, 
And uh, yeah, as said, I think there's little, and, and uh, that, that's what I wanted to say. So there is very little evidence uh, telling us, or actually there's no evidence telling us that if you have plug protrusion, that this will jeopardize early or long-term outcomes. That's true. And uh, yeah, I want to ask you, Joost, if you see a lot of thrombus protrusion, in this case thrombus protrusion, that, uh, that is, does it have an effect for post-treatment with medication or something? Uh, well, uh, yes, as, as said, so if there is a lot of uh, thrombus protrusion, so for instance, you have a thrombotic right, you put in uh, 80 mi millimeters of metal, there's a lot of lipidemic plaque, and those are the case, you do some post-dilatation and poof, no reflow. Uh, you have a beautiful result in the epicardial vessel, but the total microcirculation is, 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 is filled with thrombus. Yeah, of course, those are the cases yeah. in which I think you would, uh, would opt for a 2B3 inhibitor. But um, yeah, that said, I think yeah. we need to be uh, very meticulous in deciding uh, yeah. how much further to post dilate in case there is yeah. plug protrusion. Yeah. Doesn't help. It doesn't help. Post dilation yeah. doesn't help. Exactly. Yeah. So back to the case. Um, we'll show you the uh, the angio. So in this case, the operator made the final angio and uh, and called it a day. You know, this is the final angio. Actually, it didn't look too bad. Yeah, they even went did not extend into the circumflex, but the LAD, at least on these two angiograms, looked uh, rather okay. Um, but we've seen on the IVIS that the plug burden at the proximal edge was 75% with a very, very unstable aspect. This patient went home and actually did fine in the year that followed. But then after 14 months, he presented again with a STEMI anterior due to a thrombotic uh, ruptured plug here exactly at the spot where the uh, stand landed in the plug at the proximal LED. Uh, this patient was then, uh, due to the uh, uh, several uh, previous stand, scheduled for cabbage. Uh, we're not going to dwell into the to the to the rational behind behind this decision that was taken actually in another side, uh, but what it does show is that uh, that if you have a plug uh, with a plug burn of 50% or higher in the proximal LED, those are the plugs I, where I think you should be very careful in uh, in in leaving them alone, specifically yeah, yeah. if the plug burn is 75% with a uh, unstable yeah. uh, aspect. Yeah. Um, any comments, questions with respect to um, this case? I think we addressed already most of the questions. Yeah. If not, I think it's uh, 6.34, so that leaves us at least time to do uh, one more case. Yeah, I think this, this one. All righty, case number yeah. four. Male patient, 62 years old, um, no risk factors, uh, prostate cancer, presents with a uh, non-STEMI. Uh, this was the left coronary uh, showing a uh, intermediate plug in the in the mid LED. Also here, angio guided PCI was performed. Uh, the operator in this case implanted a 3.538 millimeter stand. Uh, post PCI FFR 0.81 performed at that time as part of the FFR React study protocol. Um, yeah, so what to do angiographically, you would say, well, perhaps there's a little bit uh, under expansion at the proximal part of the stent, uh, but yet a FFR yeah. of 0.81 is definitely the in the range uh, of, yeah. of a post-PCR FFR where you would expect that the likelihood of future adverse uh, events starts to uh, accrue substantially. So as part of the standard protocol, a uh, IVIS. Yeah. Again, uh, we start here in a normal vessel. I, uh, sorry, Rakesh. Yeah, thank you very much. Here we start again in a normal vessel and we'll uh, enlarge a bit the whole thing. For you, there it is. So we start in a normal vessel and we continue in a normal vessel and there we have the stent and the stent, the distal landing zone came in the normal vessel. So no edge sections. Continue, we see a nice round uh, lumen. Uh, the struts are well opposed, but here I see, yeah, here I have a bit of question that maybe you could do, so could have done something, a little bit more post dilatation for the under expansion. I see there's still a lot of plaque behind uh, the stent struts. But uh, the apposition and deployment is okay. And then here, what we see here at the landing zone, we have a small, very small side branch coming here. 
that may give you a false impression of a edge section, uh, but it's just the small side bands that's coming in. And proximal, we have here a certain plaque burden, and the plaque burden gets, uh, just check, it's getting even worse, more proximal. Let's see first, just outside the stent. Uh, we have here the stent, here we have the plaque burden, and actually, let's make a measurement in here to see what could have been done. The bridging question, we come back on that in a few moments. That's five point eighty four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so remember a 3.5 stand, so the optimal stand expansion area would have been 9.6. Yeah. So Indeed. this is far from yeah. what you would have hoped for when putting in a 3.5 stand. 4.89. So what will this give? Uh, I think that we will have a 60, 60 plaque burden, I think. Yeah. 60%. But now also measure the expansion, here. So yeah. if you go a bit more distal, then we go for the expansion. And we so here it looks okay, yeah. I agree. So, yeah. but I mean, you, what, what you do and what I also tend to do is, is a lot of these measurements you do with the so-called uh, carpet design, but, yeah. but at the end it's, it's, it's all about uh, measuring and mm -hmm. obviously that's not where the present forms of IVIS have their greatest advantage because you need to do a lot of manual contouring measurement we here, in this case even calculating the plug burden uh, uh, manually. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I that's it. I think the future is bright, and there's a lot of uh, lot of technologies and improvements coming up with these HDI systems that will really make our lives a lot easier in terms of automatic lumen detection, stand yeah. strut detection, stand expansion detection, etc. Yeah. So that is uh, that is something to uh, yeah, yeah to consider. Yeah, the, and 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 don't forget this is a, a Daikon viewer hey, with yep. this. Uh, uh, yeah. Limitations there. Yep. So 5.6. 5.6 distal reference area was. Yeah. This and now we go to distal reference area. And then we talk about here. And this is very. I keep I keep this lines a bit for a while. 5.6, so you can compare. So we go to the second one. So this is the normal vessel. This is a lumen. And we have 7.9. Yeah. Well, again. We so this is an interesting yeah. one. So yeah. this is a case with a 3.5 stand that reaches around 50% of its nominal expansion area. And it has a, a, a minimal stand area above 5.5. Yeah. So with that, you already reach the criteria for optimal standing. But if you look at the stand expansion, this is in the range of 70 yeah. to 80 percent so i think in these cases you need to uh, you need to use your common sense as well yeah. and think well in this case it would be the the the, the, the price of doing a post dilatation and bring up this this mla 5.52 what is what is it seven or eight could potentially uh, uh, future uh, further decrease the likelihood of uh, of stand failure in this case anyway the operator uh, also interpreted these findings and then uh, proceeded so if we can go back to the case and close the IVIS, yeah. um, we see that in this case the operator uh, at least agreed with my common sense and post dilated with 3.5 NC balloon, 20 atmospheres, did that also proximal in the stand uh, even twice and then repeated at the FFR and measured again a post PCI yeah. of yeah. 4.82. And this is actually interesting because I'll show you again the angel, although this was uh, before uh, the uh, optimization. You see, this is not a case of diffuse disease. Many pe pe people always say if you have low post PCI FFR, it's diffuse disease. But in this case, at least angiographically, and also if you look at the distal segments on the IVIS, this is not diffuse disease. This is yeah, you tell me. It's you. Yeah, maybe yeah. you know the answer, yeah. but in not in all cases you yeah. can find a, uh, a proper uh, answer to the yeah. question. I mean, we, we measured the MLA in the proximal LED was well above five. The minimal stand yeah. area was well above five. We do post dilatation in this case, 3.5 balloon, three different locations, and then still end up with a FFR of 0.82. Yeah. But then we repeated the IVs again. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, Cash, uh, can you switch to the laptop? Yeah, thank you. Here we go again. Uh, here's the normal vessel. Here's a stand. 
and I'm going slow now and then you see that with the carpenter's eye not much, point, happened, eh? not much happened in the lumen and actually I think it even decreased I just have to go in here yeah, yeah this part here now let's do a measurement And what I also like of the yeah. discussing and, 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 and looking at all these cases is that what you can see here, and I think Jürgen would agree, yeah. is that there is no calcium. No, absolutely this not. This is no. a completely fibrotic plug. So what we see here is we implant a 3.5 stand, end up with a minimal stand area, in this case of 5.4, which yeah. is, again, 50% of what you would have expected. There is a lot of recoil yeah. because of this fibrotic tissue. And I obviously this is very hypothetical, mm -hmm. but these are cases in which I mean, of course, it's yeah. it's it's all in retrospect, would have potentially yielded some additional uh, area yeah. with a, a cutting or scoring balloon. Uh, yeah. But obviously, I there there's no evidence yeah. whatsoever to support this statement. But it is interesting that uh, under expansion is not necessarily due to uh, due to concentric rings of calcium. Certainly not, indeed. So five point fifteen. 5.15 uh, yeah. even, okay, yeah. good. So that and is that virtually the same as pre yeah. post dilatation. Yeah, but then much. look at the proximal edge. Uh, now, yeah, that, there we go. I will just... To uh, see, just to see if the operator delete. in this case did not miss anything at the edge. There's no need Let's to remeasure. There we have, so at the edge, we look for the sections, not really, no, not visible, but we still have a plaque burden. Yeah. And a minimal bird. area, if I'm correct, here and yeah, yeah here maybe yeah. if you can measure yeah, that. I will do that. So again, this is the third case we'll show you with a residual plug in the proximal LED. In yeah. this case, 5 minimal 87. lumen area yeah. 5.87 5 plug burden around, I would say 70 percent. I think Let's you see. have the calculator. Right? Yeah, 5.8 divided by 15.74. Uh, yeah, so that is 65% uh, plug burden. Per definition, not meeting optimal stenting criteria. But yet, uh, again, here, uh, not a highly unstable plug. There is fibrotic tissue, no calcium, but also not that much no, lipid. No. So I would have called this a stable plug with a lumen area that was, yeah. uh, at least from a minimal lumen area perspective, in theory, sufficient. Um, so with the evidence as of today, there was no reason to further pursue any stenting here. Mm -hmm. But again, suboptimal PCI, final angiogram, MLA, proximal LED 5.7. What happens, this patient comes back 13 months later, presents with a non-STEMI, mild troponin rise. Remember, post-PCI FFR in the LED 0.83. Mm -hmm. In this case, repeat it, FFR 0.74. Yeah. So clear, likely progression of the plug at the proximal LED. And uh, because of the fact this was a non-STEMI, the operator in this case uh, also did a uh, OCT. And I don't have the OCT. We don't have the, the OCT. OCT. Well, yeah, so that so doesn't matter. Uh, I, th I think it's just for the sake of demonstration. Plug burden above 50%. Also in this case, clear progression of disease. MLA here uh, decreased now from 5.2 to 3.2. Uh, now significant FFR, in this case, uh, that was a, a stand, uh, additional stand of the proximal LED in the drug-coated balloon of the, of the distal part, and with that the patient was, uh, patient was, uh, was sent home. Um, 15 minutes left, do we do uh, a last, last case? We can do so, last huh? case, we can also address the question yeah, about... Ivis and bridging. Uh, yeah, and bridging. Is there any Ivis criterion for bridging? Now, then first of all is to start with recognizing bridging and that uh, often starts already on suspicion on your angiogram. And if you want to, um, uh, if, if you want to view that with your IVIS, then choose a lower pullback speed, uh, preferably for me half millimeter per second, then you see the real dynamics in there. Uh, well, normally, in if, uh, the bridging that uh, we demonstrated in um, uh, 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 one, case ago, uh, one case ago, this bridging will not give any uh, any problems. I once uh, 
tested that by drawing a, uh, uh, the lumen area during this heart cycle. And what you got if you made a, a, a graph of that is an exact uh, copy of your, uh, of your aortic pressure, including the, uh, the valve notch in there. So that didn't do anything. However, there are also um, ways of, of, of uh, bridging that does every uh, that uh, can do some harm and that gives complaints. Sometimes, and I recently saw one in from another hospital that uh, there was a younger lady and um, a lot of, uh, and complaints that was not really fitting with uh, their status. Had no risk factors uh, whatsoever. But there was a bridging uh, that kept on, uh, that, that uh, stayed a little bit in the lower areas because outside the vessel it looked uh, a bit, um, yeah, how do you call that? Um, uh, it looked like that if the vessel was trapped in a part uh, around it that didn't give too much weight. Now, the, um, uh, the importance of bridging, that is, uh, you, you can view it with IVUS, but I think you need to measure that with FFR, CFR, IMR, or DR, DPR in that. And then, of course, with the complaints of the patient to de detect what to do. <coughs> and often then, you, well, you know that there is a surgical way to treat that. And uh, well, with stents, it's not always a success, I think. Or what? Uh, yeah. No, that's true. I mean, it's yeah. it's 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 uh, it's always a dilemma. I mean, the yeah. the, the the likelihood you see breaching is is ten to twenty percent. So it's a yeah. very frequent phenomenon. Yeah. Um, looking at that in IVIS, you always see a systolic and diastolic yeah. movement in each picture. Yes. So that's the reason in some studies why we even look at gated IVIS images yeah. to, to look at the optimal and diastolic images yeah. to get the best and most reliable uh, uh, vessel sizing measurements. Uh, but with bridging, you simply have more uh, luminal compression per heartbeat, yeah. and that is, uh, that is a very dynamic entity yeah. I would say in some cases there's very there's 20 percent of compression but we've also seen cases in which the luminal area is compressed to yeah just squeezing the the, yeah. the iris catheter yeah. meaning yeah. the the, the at, 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 at systole the the um, minimal lumen area in these patients is is uh, one millimeter or less yeah. so in those cases you obviously have a higher likelihood that this may be associated with the symptoms of the yeah. patient. But again, at the end, the filling is, is, is in the diastolic phase. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 I would like to stick with that with respect to this answer and yeah. leave the, uh, the treatment uh, uh, up to discretion yeah. of, uh, of all of you because yeah. this is a heavily uh, yeah. and, and a widely debated uh, Exactly, thing. but to appreciate it, use a lower, free, lower uh, pullback speed. Yeah. I know assist can go up to 10 millimeter per second. Mm. With 10 millimeter per second, you will not appreciate the bridging. No. Nope, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. Okay, final case then. Case number five or is just, uh, a. I'll switch this on again yeah. because it's on the. Yeah, if you go already yeah. to the case, I will uh, start this up. Case again. five, yeah. 83 year old male patient. Hypertension, he had a pacemaker uh, 12 years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, progressive angina and he now comes in for a um, PCI of the LAD and then a circumflex and Jürgen if I'm correct will focus on the LAD yeah. today. Correct. So yeah. that was a CT of the right as you can appreciate and a nasty lesion in the uh, mid part of the LAD. A little bit of yeah let's say a subtotal lesion or maybe some aneurysmatic uh, dilatation uh, just distal just before the uh, diagonal branch. Um, in this case, the operator decided to, to treat both the diagonal as well as the LED. So uh, 2.25 semi-compliant in the LED, 1.25 in the diagonal to pre-dilate, and then yeah. IVUS. IVUS. So we can show so you this case also on the tablet. So if I recall correctly, this yeah. is also a case in which you should pay attention to the length. Yeah. The so length we need and the rep. So this is in principle, a very nice demonstration of also how I would use IVUS. So in this case, you already decide that you do your pre-dilatation, totally fine yeah. if there's no uh, uh, reluctance or hes hesitance whether or not you should need a rota. You do your pre-dilatation yeah. and then uh, you, you continue with, uh, with, with imaging to assess diameter, length, reference segments, etc. 
Okay. Now let's uh, have a look then. So we have here uh, in the we have here distal LED. There we see a um, we see here a, a fiber calcific uh, plaque on one side. If we continue, then a short spot. Well, this could be a nice reference then for uh, uh, to, to give an idea about the distal reference, which is uh, normal, but uh, then we get a diffusely diseased vessel, merely calcified, and here we have the minimal luminal area in, in fibrocalcific plaque, and we have here almost 360 degrees, a bit less, of superficial calcium, almost a napkin ring. And you can see that already the pre-dilatation did, uh, did some work. Uh, there is uh, some cracks, uh, a crack in there. More proximal, also here we have really a nice, or nice, yeah, for the patient, not so nice as 360 degrees napkin ring with a small, um, with a small lumen. Yeah, this yeah. is interesting, yeah. Jurgen. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, this is something I keep learning every yeah. time I see these cases and if you look here, yeah. there's two things to say. Yeah. One is, you're right, there, there's almost 360 yeah. degrees of calcium, but there's more. Yeah. There's also, if you look at two o'clock, and if you, if you go back yeah. and, and, and maybe keep yeah. the frame for a second. Uh, uh, this one, yeah. 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 Yeah, so if you look at two, three o'clock, there is some, some signal penetration. Yeah, absolutely here, yes. Yeah. And also at six o'clock, you see likely some tissue, yeah. some, sig some uh, signal penetration. Mm -hmm. So I would not be surprised if this is not a napkin ring. There mm -hmm. is some areas within this mm -hmm. plug that will probably yield with some more aggressive predilatation. So again, this was just a 2.5 semi-compliant yeah. balloon. Uh, I would be, uh, I would bet that this uh, lesion would, would grow or let's say the, the, this minimal luminal area would significantly increase after decent non-compliant yeah. balloon predilatation. Yeah. But just that, that with respect to how IVIS can help you to guide uh, lesion preparation in terms of calcium. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, yeah, yeah, we have three pullbacks. So this I think was the first pullback. Yeah. And for the operator in this case, this was sufficient because he was more interested in the calcium yeah. and decided in this case uh, that this, uh, yeah, let's say almost concentric ring of calcium yeah. with, and that was also st something we didn't show you, there were virtually no reverberations. No, so that is true. a um, yeah. indicator that this calcium is likely thick. Yeah. Um, and that drove the operator in this case to decide to proceed with a shockwave balloon. Um, so if we go back to the case, shockwave, trio balloon, one to one sized, 80 pulses, and then we repeated the IVIS. Just one moment. Was a gift too much away. Yeah. So there we go again. In uh, now we start in this short normal uh, region. Uh, we reach the uh, uh, we reach the calcified region, and then uh, yeah, what you see here is that this uh, then I'm getting always a little bit sad uh, because what you see here that's a sign that the ivy skeleton was not prepared. Uh, 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 well enough. That uh, means there's a small drop of air between the probe and the outside of the catheter. So then you uh, then you lose the signal. And we always find with Murphy's law, it's always on the spot <laughs> what you want to, what you mm. wanted to see. Anyway, in here we were a little bit more in luck. Then here we see the uh, the part where the shock wave. Yeah, clearly improved work. the yeah. lumen. Improved the lumen in there. You can see some healthy vessel yeah. wall at, at between six and eight o'clock. Yeah. So that's interesting. So yeah. the calcium really crack in here. Yeah. was in crack really in here. cracked. Yeah. And clearly more than with the initial uh, semi-compliant balloon. And that is the proximal. Yeah. Jürgen, yeah. can yeah. you maybe do some length measurements? Because sure. this is the pullback that you would use for the length. Yeah, then I would, uh, I think this would be a nice landing yeah. zone. So here yeah. is nice, then so we, we look this. for an area yeah. where the lumen is big and yeah. the plug burn is less than 50%. So I start here. Oh, sorry, I did. I start here. Mm. And then we go back. This is what we want to 
to check uh, yeah, to go include. all the way distal maybe to 28 all the way. Yeah, yeah i think I would so go to 28 i think that we already oh sorry yeah i need this one sometimes the tablet is is a bit uh, yeah yeah the there tablet is we not go it's not your best friend huh? it's not my best friend but not, not yet not yet <laughs> yeah this you want to cover yeah and I then we continue so. yeah yeah we continue uh, i'm going to do with the fingers now because that is yeah there we go this we want to yeah let's go to this normal part yeah. i think this is the part that you yeah. want to land in yeah not uh, here maybe not here but a little bit here yeah yeah, yeah. then we get f almost 50. yeah almost 50. um yeah so that's what you would need we have yeah. 48 stands so that would likely uh suffice mm -hmm. but um yeah proper measurement i mean of course you could you could cheat a little bit by by taking off one millimeter on both sides but yeah this is highly likely what you would need so if yeah. you go back to the case oops uh we can see that the uh operator here proceeded with a 3038 mm -hmm. post dilated with a trio non-compliant balloon and had a very nice angiographic result we have to yeah. say angiographic good result diagonals diffusely diseased but small Dimitri flow so uh, i could understand that there was no reason to uh, to to continue with the diagonals yeah. but uh what was also nice is that the uh, ivis was repeated yeah and that is the final ivis we're yeah. going to show you today so we'll take you again distal stand edge distal yeah. reference looks beautiful yeah this a reference here we, i would have <coughs> expected the stand in mm -hmm. uh, it's not there and you see it's more proximal in yeah. uh, in a lesion there i yeah. just for the time i will measure a bit the diameter yeah trio 2 stand 2.6 uh -uh. not yeah. bad not and bad but minimal also stand area you maybe yeah. the middle stand are uh, we good uh, that is with the carpenter's eyes so i expected yeah this is uh, the uh, the calcified region i check if i find another smaller region yeah this is the smallest part in here this is the minimal luminal mm, area yeah I agree. let's do that and there we go Four point two. Three. Four point three. Yeah. That's less than five. Eh? That's less yeah, than that's five less than in five. a proximal LED. Uh, whereas the distal reference area in this case is, is if you go back. There we go. In here. Seven point five. Yeah, so that equals a uh, stand expansion of fifty six uh, percent. Yeah. And that is uh, clearly suboptimal. So yeah. also in this case, a stand that was at least distally too short mm. and did not land in a healthy reference yeah. segment. So this uh, stand per definition without measuring all the rest would not qualify for a stand that meets the uh, optimal IVIS yeah. criteria for standing. Yeah, but the then we, uh, we scroll through the pullback. You see here the side of the uh, severe calcification. Yeah. The, the area is actually uh, decent. Yeah. And, and the proximal then, yeah. we see the exact same yeah. thing right yeah we see the stand landing in the middle of yeah. the plug yeah here is uh, and you see it's landing actually at the bifurcation of a diagonal and a septal branch yeah. in here yeah and then outside here we have yeah here we have plug a lot of yeah. plug i think yeah. yeah it's made a bit difficult due to the calcium in there to draw but let's go in here yeah. actually this would be from my point of view a more friendly part yeah. To, to land in yeah. but uh, yeah, and yeah. That probably he would reach that if uh, if he would take in the 48 yeah in yeah. This case. yeah so again uh, we, we thought a nice demonstration on how you can be fooled by the by the angio the angio looked actually uh, uh, excellent uh, and would have yielded a round of applause yeah. when we would have done this as a live case yeah. Yeah. but with the uh, with the IFIS we, we, we you clearly see that with picking the stand of the exact same price that would yeah. have been six or eight millimeters yeah. longer in this case would have allowed you to stand from healthy to healthy and uh, highly likely uh, decrease the likelihood of future adverse cardiovascular yeah. events so that's that um, 
That's what we wanted to show yeah, today. That's what we to show. Any final comments, Jurgen? Yeah, no, well, it's uh, well, healthy to healthy, but try to at least to be less than 50% plug burden. Uh, because that was the, the message yeah, of today. The, uh, yeah. the red line throughout yeah. the, uh, the five cases that we've showed yeah. you, try to find optimal landing zones. Yeah. Obviously not possible in case of diffuse disease, but in most cases, as also shown you today, yeah. uh, you will be able to find healthy reference yeah. segments. And take your time to look at your IVUS. You see that uh, sometimes people want to run and run and run. And then uh, and some, uh, what I always advise, and that is, uh, well, this is uh, a, a trolley on a cart, but if you have uh, integrated system, uh, don't stand there because that is not a nice uh, way. You have uh, back pain, you're in pain in the neck to look at that, but go behind uh, uh, in the control room and uh, sit down and, and, uh, and, and take your time to, to make your measurements. You see, that's, uh, that's the idea because nobody is running after you. And, uh, and nobody uh, is, is happy if your patients come back because you didn't take the time for the measurements. Yeah, yeah. I totally yeah. agree. That said, uh, yeah. we thank you. Um, we'll keep you posted also on behalf of, of, of Assist for future webinars yeah. as the plan is to keep on uh, doing these series. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us in case of any further yeah. questions. Don't hesitate to reach out to, to your uh, Assist. Uh, 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 staff that, that, that might visit you in the hospital. And uh, just as a friendly, friendly reminder, all these webinars are also available for offline review on YouTube. Yeah. Thank you, enjoy You're the welcome. evening, and um, we look forward to seeing you again. Okay, thank you.